Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Before we begin today's session of the comprehensive news analysis, an important announcement that all of you have been waiting for. This is time for the Target Prelims 2022 course to return. A lot of you people have been flooding the comment section asking when the course will resume. This was a course that was done on our YouTube channel last year and lakhs of aspirants saw the course and were successful in clearing the prelims examination. It is back and the course will begin on 30th of April 2022 live on our YouTube channel every evening from 7.30 till 9.30 p.m. Each and every subject of the UPSC prelims syllabus will be covered along with 365 day current affair coverage through questions. Make sure that you attend each and every session. If you have not subscribed to the Baiju's IES YouTube channel till now, please do that right away so that you can get a notification as soon as the live session begins. Now let's begin today's session of the comprehensive news analysis with the first article that focuses on the power sharing mechanism in South Asia specifically. The author here says that nations in South Asia including India, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Pakistan, Maldives, all of these nations have similar problems when it comes to electricity infrastructure. All of these are developing nations and have been trying to provide 24-7 electricity to their population for many years now. And there has been a considerable progress made in that aspect. For example, Bangladesh has achieved 100% electrification recently. Bhutan, Maldives, Sri Lanka already did so in 2019. And India also is on its way with already 94.4% coverage. In the past three decades or so, the amount of electricity that is generated in South Asia has increased many fold. In 1990, the total electricity generated in South Asia was about 340 terawatts hours, which has now increased to 1500 terawatt hours in 2015 and it has increased even further today. This points out towards multiple things. Number one, the power generation infrastructure is increasing at a very rapid pace. We are able to transmit power at a much more significant level and we have been able to decrease the losses. Secondly, the power supply demand also has increased considerably. Many nations in South Asia, including India, Bangladesh, etc. have become the hubs of manufacturing of different kinds. These industries require a lot of power and thankfully the governments have been able to deliver on that front. That has also led to a good amount of development seen in nations such as Bangladesh. Thirdly, this also points out towards the reason why the GDP of this region has constantly increased in the past two or three decades. Because electricity generation has a direct impact on increasing GDP. The article in fact tells us that for every 0.46% increase in energy consumption, it has been seen that it leads to 1% increase in the GDP per capita. That is why over half of Bangladesh's GDP right now comes from industrial and agricultural sector, which cannot function without proper electricity supply. So we have seen in the past three decades how leaps and bounds of progress has been made in electricity generation and transmission in South Asia. The interesting part is that every country is doing it in a different manner. For example, India still relies heavily on coal with about half of our electricity coming from coal. For Nepal, 99.9% .9 of its energy comes from hydropower, while 75% of Bangladesh's power comes from natural gas. Thus, there is a lot of diversity as we are seeing around this area. Now, what the author here is saying is that because there is a lot of diversity in the nations of South Asia when it comes to electricity generation, we can learn a lot from each other and complement on each other's strengths. For example, India by far has been the leader in adopting renewable energy resources. We have been focusing a lot on wind, solar, etc. and we have been having considerable amount of progress. Similarly, India can do well in exporting this kind of technology to the neighborhood nation so that we can build up on our soft power. The good part with South Asia is that we have been bestowed with multiple renewable energy resources including hydropower as we have seen in case of Nepal and Bhutan, solar in case of India, in case of Sri Lanka and even Pakistan, wind again in case of Sri Lanka, the coastal island nation in case of India, geothermal and biomass. So all of these resources can be utilized very well by the South Asian nations. And there have been multiple examples of that happening in the past as well. For example, there was a hydro trade agreement signed in 2010 between India and Bhutan, which was a first clean development mechanism to ensure 
that it results in poverty reduction, energy efficiency and improved way of life. And it is not just India which is going ahead with renewable energy. Bangladesh also in many of its rural areas has been giving a proper push to the rooftop solar panel program. So much so that 45% of its power need in the rural areas is now coming from these kind of solar panel programs. And development of one nation in our neighborhood augurs well for other nations as well, since the fruits of economic development spread across the border as we have seen in the past few years. The good part is that India has been extremely active in forging energy and electricity agreements with our neighbors in the past few years. We have the India-Nepal petroleum pipeline deal. We also have the India-Bhutan hydroelectric joint venture. Then there's Myanmar-Bangladesh-India gas pipeline. We have the Bangladesh-Bhutan-India-Nepal and also many other initiatives. For example, the important role that India is playing along with Russia in setting up Bangladesh's first nuclear power plant. And the results are for everyone to see on the ground. India exports 1200 megawatt of electricity to Bangladesh. Bhutan similarly exports 70% of its hydropower electricity to India and also earns precious foreign exchange in return. Nepal also has been exporting its surplus hydroelectricity to India and also has been exporting fossil fuels to India worth over $1 billion because they don't need it since most of their electricity is coming from hydropower resources anyway. So it's a win-win situation for everyone in South Asia provided that the bilateral relations remain good and every country is true to the deal that is being signed on the table. Now let me show you certain numbers from the government side about how much electricity are we importing or exporting to our neighborhood nations. Now this table shows you the electricity import and export by India for the financial year 2019-2020. This data is from Jan 2020, so it's not the most updated one, but it does give you a kind of an idea. So for example, if you can see from Bhutan, India imports a significant amount of electricity. On the other hand, we export quite a bit of electricity to Bangladesh, Nepal and even Myanmar. Thus, it's a win-win situation for all these nations. Now, because we are ensuring sharing of electricity across the borders, there obviously has to be a policy or certain guidelines that are managing this particular kind of a transaction. So for that, we have something called the guidelines for import export cross border of electricity that were first released in 2018. These guidelines govern the trade of electricity across the border. Now it was in 2014 that India first explored the possibility of having electricity sharing with our neighbors on a large scale under the SARC framework. However, we started to realize that there is also a possibility of China coming into this and playing the spoiled sport. We did not want any Chinese investment in such power infrastructure, neither on the Indian side nor in our border areas. And that is why the 2018 guidelines were released to ensure that we do not have any Chinese investment in such projects. Through this new electricity rules, India is trying to ensure that we stop the growing influence of China, at least in our own neighborhood. The reason why India has been able to play such a critical role here is that if you see the location of India, we are kind of in the middle of South Asian nations. So we have a good connectivity to multiple South Asian nations, be it Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Bangladesh and even Pakistan. And that is what is going in favor of India. However, there are some issues right now which are still stopping India from realizing its complete potential. For example, in many of these nations, especially the ones that export electricity to India, be it Bangladesh, be it Nepal, there have been certain protests where people believe that the governments of those nations are giving electricity to India at the expense of the local population. So for example, Bangladesh, rather than supplying electricity to its own people, is selling electricity to India. These kind of protests have been seen in Nepal also. This adds to kind of a negative image in the minds of the local people, especially who live in those areas which are deprived of constant electricity supply. So this is a problem that India has to overcome in these particular nations. Apart from that, the other problem that we see here is, since India's economy, India's size, market, stature is many folds more than all our neighboring nations in South Asia, there is always a kind of a distrust in the minds of these smaller nations. 
For instance, whenever we sign a bilateral agreement, there are always second thoughts in the minds of these smaller nations as to whether or not it is in their favor or not. The next article that we have here is about the big news about the relaunching of All India Household Consumer Expenditure Survey. Now, in simple terms, this is an old survey which the government of India usually releases every five years, meaning that the last one was done in 2017-18. But the point is that in 2017-18, the data of this survey was never released by the government. Why? The government gave an excuse saying that there is a lot of data discrepancy and that is why we are not willing to make this data public. Now, a lot of people criticize this because this is a very, very important data that shows about the expenditure made at the rural and at the urban level. And without this data coming out, how can the government make adequate policies? But despite all the criticism, the government of India did not release the data in 2017-18. But now the government is saying that we are all set to relaunch the All India Household Consumer Expenditure Survey. Now, although the government is launching the survey, but after the numbers come out, whether or not the government releases it again or not, that still remains a question. People who are criticizing the government said, the reason that the government did not release the numbers last time around was that the numbers were not very positive. It was the first time ever that there was a monthly reduction in the per capita spending of the household since 1972. And because the government wanted to avoid the embarrassment, that is why the government did not release it. This is what the critics of the government say. Now, you don't have to be an expert to understand that in a country such as India, which such a huge population, so many problems and so much diversity, any policy of the government can only work best if it is based on concrete data. Unless the government knows is the people's earning increasing or decreasing, how much are the people spending, what are the problems of the people, unless the government has exact amount of information on these things, how can the government make good policies? That is why such kind of a report, such kind of a data is essential for policies to be made in an effective manner. Thus, the decision of 2017-18 by the government to not release the data was heavily criticized and was seen as being damaging to India. The one thing that India is very proud of is that we are not China. China is one of those countries where the government controls everything and that is why we don't believe any numbers coming from China. We saw what happened during the pandemic when the entire world was seeing thousands and thousands of people losing their lives and when China was saying that no one is dying in our country, no one was believing that data because we know that data coming out of China is unreliable because the government plays a major role in deciding what they will tell to the public and what they will not. By doing the same in 2017, India hurt its image and we have to ensure that the differentiation point between India and China still exists. And that is why the government's decision to relaunch the All India Household Consumer Expenditure Survey is being seen in the positive light. Now, if you actually see the Household Consumer Expenditure Survey, mainly what the survey does is it helps to assess the poverty levels with the consumption patterns throughout the country. It sees how much are the people spending usually on day-to-day -day life, are they being able to spend enough money to fulfill their priorities or not? Since the last survey's numbers were not released, the last numbers of the survey that we have are from the ones of 2011-12 because the survey after that was never released for the public. Now, this is just the beginning because it will collect data throughout the year and that is why the survey will be conducted between July 2022 and June 2023. So, there is still a long gap between now and when the data actually comes out. Now, if you actually see this survey, this is called a quinquennial survey. Quinquennial means something that happens once in every five years. This is conducted by the National Sample Survey Office, that is the NSSO. There are multiple good takeaways from the survey. For example, it reveals the average expenditure on goods including food and non-food and services. It generates the estimates of monthly per capita consumer expenditure along with the distribution of households and people. The reason why we need it so importantly is that India has not had any official estimate on per capita household spending. Since this survey provides us data for rural and urban parts and also about the spending patterns, this is essential for the policymakers to make a real difference. 
The next article that we have is about a territorial dispute which is long pending between Japan and Russia. Now this is not a new dispute, it is the Kuril Islands. But the reason why this is in the news now is because of what Japan has done. Japan in their official diplomatic blue book of 2022 have described the Kuril Islands as being under the Russian illegal occupation. Now the interesting part is that this territory has always been at the center of controversy between Japan and Russia but never ever has a Japanese side used such strong language to define the Kuril Islands and the dispute. For example, since 2003 they have been saying that yes this is a dispute and a concern but we will not let it come in between our bilateral relations. But all of a sudden this language by Japan has come as a surprise for everyone and is being seen as a result of what Russia is doing in Ukraine to capture more territory. So if you see the photo over here, the Kuril Islands are actually a set of four islands which are situated between the Sea of Okhotsk and the Pacific Ocean near the north of Japan's northernmost prefecture which is called Hokkaido. Prefecture in very simple terms is basically a district which comes under the authority of a governor or a prefect as you used to have in our schools. So the history is that after the World War II, the Soviet Union had captured these islands because they were on the winning side while the Japanese were on the losing side. Soon after that, the Soviet Union asked the Japanese residents of the island to leave and since then the islands have been under the control of the Soviet Union. Japan on the other hand says that we have signed multiple treaties in the past which indicate that the islands belong to Japan. Russia on the other hand say that if you are showing us the treaties, we also have many treaties to prove that this belongs to Soviet Union. Russia says that look at the Yalta Agreement of 1945 or look at the Potsdam Declaration of 1945 or even the San Francisco Treaty of 1951. In all these treaties which have been signed by the Japanese representatives, these group of islands have been shown as a part of the Soviet occupation. For example, in the San Francisco Treaty of 1951, Russia says that if you read the second article of the treaty, it says Japan had renounced all right, claim and title to the Korean Islands. On the other hand, Japan also made an interesting point. They say that the San Francisco Treaty cannot be used here because the Soviet Union never signed the peace treaty. Now what is a peace treaty? See whenever the two nations go on a war, in order to officially end the war, it is required that the two sides sign a peace treaty in which they agree that okay from now onwards we are not going to attack the other nation. It is a very usual occurrence whenever the two nations go on a war. Interestingly however, Japan and Russia never signed this treaty after the second world war. Meaning that technically Japan and Russia are still at war only because they never signed a peace treaty after World War II. So Japan says when we did not even sign the peace treaty, how can you say that now we are going as per the San Francisco treaty because the war never ended officially. So these islands do not belong to you. They have always belonged to Japan. Since the second world war, both the sides have been trying to ensure that this issue actually is sorted. While Russia has also done this in the past with the visit of Mikhail Gorbachev to Japan, Japan also has taken similar initiatives on their side. The latest of them was when the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe announced that they would like to have economic development of these islands so that there are economic benefits that can be taken out of it. One of the reasons was, it was seen that Japan was trying to improve its ties with Russia, specifically to ensure that they have diverse energy sources. As we have discussed multiple times in the past couple of months, Russia is a very energy rich nation and being very close to Japan geographically, Japan sees it as a good source of energy import. That is why they wanted to improve their relationship with Russia and they wanted to put an end to this dispute of the Kuril Islands. However, it did not happen. And now with the Russian government adopting such an aggressive policy of occupying territory of the other nations, it has forced Japan also to make a strong statement in this regard of the Kuril Islands. Now if you look at it from the Russian side, obviously no country right now would like to give its territory to the other country even if it is not in any use because it goes against their nationalistic vision. However, in this case, Russia is in fact trying to use these islands for their defense purposes. For example, the Russian coastal defense missile batteries have been deployed at the Kunashir 
and the Itarup Islands, which are very, very close to Japan. Not just this, Russia is even planning to set up a new naval base in this region. The reason why Russia also is pretty keen on doing this is because they think that there can be good energy and fishing resources nearby these islands. So anyone who controls this can make a lot of economic gain out of it. Now this article in the beginning mentions that the Japanese had made this claim strongly on the Kuril Islands in their diplomatic blue book. So just to give you an idea, the diplomatic blue book of Japan is actually nothing but an annual report of Japan's foreign policy, which is published by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan since September 1957. So it's an annual report that talks about the official foreign policy of Japan. Now, as I said, the Kuril Islands, which are at the center of the controversy, are actually made up of four very, very small islands. And the first time that both the sides agreed that this is a dispute was in 1956. The two sides made a declaration called the Japan-Soviet Joint Declaration. It said that the dispute over these islands has prevented the conclusion of a peace treaty to end the Second World War. Although the two sides did resume their diplomatic ties after 1956, the issue of these islands could not be solved even then. Russia did agree to hand over two of the four islands. Japan did not agree because these two islands only made up 7% of the land of the total four islands. So 93% of the land Russia wanted to keep it with itself and only 7% it was ready to give to Japan. That is why the issue remains unresolved even today. The next article that we have is actually a kind of an article taken from the archives of the Hindu newspaper. The Hindu newspaper has published it once again saying that even today, there are so many important constitutional cases that are pending at the Supreme Court, something that the court should pay attention to. The reason why this article is written is because recently the Chief Justice of India made a statement that once the vacations are over, that is the summer vacations, he would request the other judges also to take up important constitutional cases, including the abrogation of Article 370. Now, this article makes a mention of a lot of important constitutional cases which have been pending at the Supreme Court level for a very, very long time. And they have not even been heard by the court due to various reasons, be it the abrogation of Article 370, the amendment to the Citizenship Act, be it the issue of the electoral bonds, or even the amendment in the UAPA Act. All of these have a profound impact on how the country will run. But even then, the Supreme Court has not found the time to look into these cases and they have remained pending for a very very long time now which goes against the idea of the constitution makers the author here says that if you look at the transcripts of the constituent assembly there was a discussion in the assembly that all the constitutional bench cases should have been resolved within one month so ideally there should have been a one month limit given to the supreme court judges for these cases however this was never accepted and it was not a part of the constitution. But just that this idea was discussed in the constituent assembly means that the members of the constituent assembly were well aware that the people's right in the country will only be preserved if important cases like the constitutional cases which impact the entire country are heard and disposed of in a quick manner. If you have been reading the papers, you would have seen the Chief Justice of India made a statement that in the era of instant noodles, people want instant justice. Now, while yes, instant justice is not something that anyone should desire, but both the extremes are equally bad. That is, waiting for many, many years just to hear such important cases and on the other hand, giving a judgment within a couple of days. There has to be a middle path between the two, which should be the ideal way forward. The author here says that abrogation of Article 370, which people are not even talking about right now, apart from Jammu and Kashmir, is a very, very important question that should be answered. The Supreme Court has to decide, can the centre government take undue advantage of Article 356 when there is no government present at the state? As you know, the decision to convert Jammu Kashmir into a union territory and divide it into two parts was taken when the state was still under the president's rule and there was no government at the state level. If this is found to be acceptable, then as per the author, what is stopping the government from doing the same with other states? There can be president rule imposed under Article 356 and in the absence of the state government, any action can be taken which is irreversible. For this to stop happening in the future, as per the author, the Supreme Court must hear the matter 
as soon as possible. The other matter with the court has still not heard is the electoral bond scheme. So the interesting part is this case of electoral bonds was actually filed in the court in 2019, in the beginning of 2019. Then the Supreme Court said that no elections are very close, let the elections happen and then we'll hear the case. Now the interesting part is 2019 elections have happened and the government has even completed three years of its tenure. And we are again now on the other half of the government. That is the court has still not even heard the matter even though the government has completed half of its tenure. And now again, maybe when you go to the court, they will again say, oh, the elections are very near. Now we can't hear this case. This also goes against the Supreme Court's dignity that the Supreme Court is not hearing such matters. Although the Supreme Court did say that if the Election Commission of India wants, again, not a directive to the Election Commission, just a suggestion that if the Election Commission of India wants, they can disclose the people who are donating what amount to the political parties. Supreme Court, which usually gives directives to any agency, giving just a suggestion to the election commission, not making it mandatory, was also seen as something very weird. But Supreme Court has not been able to take up this matter effectively. Same is the case with provisions of UAPA, the CAA law. All of these still remain pending at the Supreme Court level and people are looking towards the Supreme Court with a lot of hope which the court should uphold as per the author. Now, this is not the first time that there have been concerns raised, especially about the pending constitutional matters in the court. If you actually see, there is no official data from the side of the court or the government that tells you how many constitutional cases are pending. However, there are a lot of NGOs working in the field of judiciary that have tried to compile this data, which say that some of the cases at the constitutional bench level have been pending for decades, if not more which represents a very sorry state of affairs. If you want to go ahead and look at the total number of pending cases in the Indian judiciary, all you have to do is go on Google and search for National Judicial Data Grid, which is a portal that gives you real-time update about the pending cases in India at all the levels. As you can see, as of today, the number of cases pending in India are 4 crore, 12,23,829. This includes cases at all the levels. Now, the sad part here is that you can find individual data about specific courts on this portal. You can even find data about individual high courts at this portal, but not the Supreme Court. Willingly or unwillingly, Supreme Court has ensured that they are not a part of this portal system and you can't find a lot of details there. However, this seems to be changing now. There was a news a few weeks back that Supreme Court may soon be on the national judicial data grid and they would be open to scrutiny, which is again seen as a positive step towards transparency. These are the articles we wanted to discuss on the Hindu news but today, a couple of practice questions. Number one, liberal electricity sharing policies with neighboring nations can add a new dimension to India's soft power. Elaborate. Second. Policies that are not based on concrete data are destined to fail. Discuss. Both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each. Thank you so much for watching the video.